Hello, and welcome to Literacy Volunteers New Tutor Training. This presentation is about understanding the lives of adult ELL students. In this lesson, you will learn about the lives of new Mainers as they resettle here in Maine and in the United States, learn the difference between a refugee, asylum seeker, and immigrant, strengthen your understanding of American culture as it relates to other cultural contexts, and be able to consider alternative perspectives when encountering sticky situations. English language learners, sometimes called New Americans or New Mainers, lead busy lives. They are husbands and fathers, mothers and wives, workers, students, community leaders, business owners, and some of our newest citizens. When they're not busy with work and family, you can often find our students taking advantage of many different services um, that are available within the community. The Department of Health and Human Services offers help with food, um, Medicaid, and other services that help to support families that are going through transitions. FedCap is a program for folks who are looking to get connected with work or get work training. The Career Center also does um, some similar work. There are many services available for people through the City of Portland. Um, WIC is a program that provides um, uh, vouchers to purchase healthy food for women and children and infants. Um, students are engaged in many different programs at the uh, Portland Adult Education and ILAP is a service where uh, people can uh, in sign up to get linked to a free legal services um, which will help them to um, create strong applications especially for the asylum process. While the lives of our students are busy in much the same way that most people are, their lives are made a little bit more complicated or stable by virtue of their legal status. Students in our program, as we've mentioned before, are either immigrants to this country, asylum seekers, or refugees. But can you tell which of these people is a refugee or an asylum seeker uh, just by looking at them? It's difficult to tell, so let's talk about that. An immigrant is someone who moves to a new country of their own volition. People may do this for marriage, to join a family member for employment, or to take advantage of a better quality of life. A refugee is a person who flees their home country to find safety in a refugee camp. While at the refugee camp, those individuals and families apply for entry into a receiving country. Once approved, they are provided with a pathway to access needed services, education, employment, and other services that smooth their resettlement in their new country. An asylum seeker flees their home country much like a refugee. refugee. However, instead of going to a refugee camp, they go directly to another country. Once in the new country, these individuals or families go through the asylum application process to seek sanctuary in that country. Currently, this process is taking approximately five years to complete in the state of Maine. Here's how it breaks down. Refugees are provided with a social security number and work authorization upon arrival to this, new, to this country. They can apply for Medicaid, social security, and other benefit programs. After five years, they must apply for citizenship. They don't have to pass the test if they're not able to, but they must apply and keep trying. Asylum seekers can apply for work authorization after their asylum application has been pending for 150 days. Their work authorization will come roughly 180 days after their initial, uh, after it's been submitted. Once asylum has been granted, they must apply for citizenship after five years. However, if asylum is not granted, individuals and families are deported back to their country or to the last country they came from. It's important to note that many of our asylum students are um, 
experiencing this level of ambiguity, some of whom have been here for a number of years and whose cases have not yet been um, concluded, uh, continue to be uh, waiting to find out what the ultimate result will be. Will they be able to stay or will they have to go? Um, oftentimes, if people receive asylum, they will send for family members because at that point, they've been given a green card and are able to access the community the same way that a refugee would. And they're able to send for family members who may be experiencing the same kind of danger that they fled. Um, so it's not always easy to tell that someone is an asylum seeker or a refugee or an immigrant. Their status may change, and it may change based on whether or not they came as an asylum seeker or whether or not they, came, they were sent for by someone who was granted asylum. Another thing to note is that many of our students um, come to to the United States because they've won the lottery. I should say not many, but it's not uncommon to find students who have won the lottery. And so they come to the country with a green card and with a social security number and the means to access all of the, the areas of society that they would not be able to access if they were an asylum seeker. In the welcome presentation, we talked about where many of our students come from, but let's distinguish which groups are typically refugees and which are typically asylum seekers. The largest groups of refugees in the greater Portland area come from Somalia, Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Syria. And the largest groups of asylum seekers come from Djibouti, Rwanda, Burundi, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, the Republic of Congo, Angola, and then there are a smattering of students who come from many other different countries who are also here seeking asylum. If you look around, you can see that Portland has become a little melting pot, which entails not only a mix of peoples, but also their cultures. But what does culture mean, and how does it affect learning, and how does it affect relationships we build with people who are not from our shared or common culture. Wade W. Noble says that culture is not simply the song and dance of a people, nor is it merely the compilation of their holidays or the listing of their heroes and heroines. Culture is a vast structure of behaviors, attitudes, values, habits, beliefs, customs, rituals, language, and ceremonies peculiar to a particular group of people that provides them with the general design for living and patterns for interpreting reality. A people's indigenous culture anchors them to reality and must be the starting point for all learning. In this community, we celebrate our cultural differences. However, as educators, we understand that learning to live in a new country can be challenging because a new country is written in an invisible language that must be illuminated in order for adult ELL learners to be successful. Before we can develop awareness about another's culture, we have to examine our own, specifically those things that make us American those common values and traits that most of us share and or recognize as being quintessentially American. The document attached to this slide is called Common American Traits. Take a look at it. Do you agree with the list of traits and values that have been assembled? If not, why? If you're looking to learn more about culture, you may want to check out Gary Weaver's assessment of American cultural values at the link below. To access the document, Common American Traits, just click the picture. To begin our a discussion of culture, let's start with Edward T. Hall's theory of low context and high context culture to help us better understand the powerful effect of culture on communication. 
ways of communication is a result of the culture of a certain region. So to understand these two types of cultures, we must first understand the two modes of communication, high context and low context. Low context communication, and we think of people in low context styles of communication as being from the West, so the United States, England, Germany, so on and so forth, um, can we communicate in a way in which messages are explicit and blunt. Um, we're very task-centered. The duration of communication is uh, thought to be best short, and knowledge as accumulated is made public. So there is no person who is the dispenser of knowledge. There are no people who are kept away from information by virtue of status, for instance. Access may be an issue, but otherwise, information is meant to be shared and accessible. When we look at high context communication, we typically think of the East, although I want to be clear about the distinctions here. We're not simply just talking about East versus West. Low context and high context styles of communication or cultures of communication are found everywhere. They can be found within families, within your workplace. It really just depends on the, the people who share that space with you often and the values that guide your communication with each other. Um, but if we're just going to be playing you know, a game in which we compare and contrast the two of these, we can juxtapose them as East versus West. So in high context or Eastern style communication, the message is explicit and indirect. Thus, people expect you to understand more than what is said. Deciphering the message is expected by the listener and huge responsibility of understanding lies on him or her. There is a hierarchy at work within high context communication, and it means that people who are in those contexts must defer oftentimes to whomever it is that is at the top of the hierarchy um, to relay those messages. Those messages are relayed down. They are not necessarily explicit. You do have to read the tea leaves. And if this is not something that you're practiced in doing, then oftentimes, for instance, as an American, you might experience a great deal of frustration. Um, or if you're from another country, you, you might experience Americans as being entirely too blunt, um, which can feel, you know, I think people can feel often very easily offended. So here's one way, um, a visual for thinking about communication in high context versus low context communi um, cultures. Um, as we've said, the high context culture and the, 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 the chart here is giving us China as an example is less explicit, more internalized understanding of what is communicated, multiple intersections with other, there's long-term relationships, really strong boundaries, which just means those groups are very close-knit. Um, knowledge is situational and relational, so what you know is based on who you know oftentimes and the, the areas of society that you have access to. And if you don't know people who are in the know, and if you're not someplace where knowledge is transmitted, then you are, you're not someone who is in possession or has access to learning certain things. Um, decisions and activities focus around personal face-to-face -face relationships, which, of course, I think just underpins the idea that long that relationships within high-context cultures are very long-term and those boundaries are very strong and stable. Um, in a low context, or the West in general, um, people pay attention to external rules and processes. Um, there's a process for how you get a job, whereas in some places in the world, the jobs you have are based on who you know. Um, more knowledge is codified, it's public, it's external, it's accessible to people. Um, there is a separation of time and space of activities. So we we get up at a certain time, we go to bed at a certain time, dinner time is at a certain time, we, time is, is, is very much a way in which we structure our day and compartmentalize our activities. Um, more interpersonal connections of shorter duration. So we're in contact with many people, but those relationships may not be long lasting. They may be useful, they may be um, instrumental, but they may not always um, stay with you throughout your life. 
um, knowledge is um, most often transferable and um, we're very task centered. The, the picture, the charts up above give you an idea of what those lines of communication look like. Um, in the West, you are the single point for distributing information. However, if you go to China, for instance, you see that there are circles within circles of how information is communicated or decisions get made. Here's another um, picture I liked, um, which I think um, brings home this, this idea that communication is explicit. If you are high con or sorry, low context and implicit, if you are low context. So on the right in the blue, we've got high context. Um, we see the issue is the black dot in the center and we're very direct. We will go right over the black dot. We will direct, directly address whatever issue or um, thing needs to be communicated. Whereas if the black dot in the red is the issue in a high context culture, you may skirt it a little bit. Um, you may talk around it enough to give someone the impression um, of what it is that you're talking about without necessarily naming it exactly because to do so would violate cultural mores and could be um, offensive to others. This comic strip is um, another one. Uh, take a look at it. It contrasts Japanese rejection with Singaporean rejection. One of the most common challenges our tutors have with students is timeliness. And that's not to say that this is always the case, but it is consistently on a regular basis a, a complaint that we hear. Um, and, and this is because our relationship with time is cultural and our students are in a learning curve. They're learning how to be monochronic people having come from polychronic cultures. So monochronic people, that's us, that's Americans, tend to do one thing at a time are not easily distracted, commit to work, place importance on deadlines, stick to plans, value and respect privacy, relate punctuality to reputation, and accept short-term relationships. Um, we as Americans and other Western, or um, our other Western counterparts, we live by the clock. As I said previously, we get up at a certain time, we go to work at a certain time, we finish at a certain time, we eat dinner at a certain time, we make time for everything. For us, time is a commodity and it is something that is worth um, money or worth energy. And this is something our students are all trying to learn. This idea that you make time and you only make so much of it for your tutoring sessions with your student um, is, is something that they are learning how to deal in. Not everyone, like I said, but occasionally and consistently, this is something that we hear about. And this is because many of our students come from places where time is polychronic. Uh, they do several things at the same time, are susceptible to distractions, commit to relationships, not to work, place less importance on deadlines, change plans often and easily, value connection, relate punctuality to relationships, and lead, um, sorry, lean towards lifetime relationships. Here's another way of thinking about it on the next slide. As you see um, in this picture, on uh, the left side in the blue, we have our monochronic or our um, low context um, folks. And on, in the red, we have our polychronic or our high context. Um, in the blue, when it's 12 o'clock, it's 12 o'clock. If your work starts at 12, you should be there at 12. Or as my father used to say, if you're five minutes early, you're on time. If you're on time, you're late. Um, and that's very much how we think about time in the U.S. 
Um, in other places, other parts of the world, time is much more fluid. There's always time for everything. You make time for everything. If a meeting starts at 12, you might come at 11. Why not? You may come to chat with some folks. You may be chatting with people along the way to the meeting um, when the meeting starts, when most people arrive. And as you see um, in the red here, um, that if you say 12 o'clock, people will arrive anywhere between an hour early or two hours late because there's always enough time. Here are some of the main differences between high context and low context cultures. On the high context side, how things get done depends on relationships with people and attention to group process. Um, one's identity is rooted in the groups they are in, i.e. family, work, and culture. Um, social structure and authority are centralized. There's that hierarchy again. Responsibility is at the top. Person at top works for the good of the group. And space is communal. People stand close together and share the same space. On the low context side, things get done by following procedures and paying attention to the goal. I, I don't know how many times when I was in school, the teacher said you didn't follow the directions, which was because following the directions and paying attention to procedures is the way in which things get done. And there are many times where um, our students will fill out applications and they may not fill them out correctly. And because they've done that incorrectly, they're penalized in some way and or their application is misinterpreted in a way that they hadn't met before. One's identity is rooted in oneself and one's accomplishments. Social structure is decentralized. Responsibility goes further down. It's not central, centralized or concentrated at the top. Space is compartmentalized and privately owned. Space is important, so people are further apart. We have um, our personal space bubble, and, and sometimes um, we'll, we're talking about experiences that we've had. People will often say, oh, he was in my bubble or she was in my bubble. And it's because we, the way that we perceive space is culturally rooted. When it comes to relationships, um, people in high context cult cultures have very stable, close-knit relationships that usually carry them through their, the, the lifespan. Um, those connections are important because they can be leveraged to help you uh, get jobs or to do things that you might otherwise not be able to do if you didn't have them. On the low context side, interpersonal relationships are really short, um, lived oftentimes. If you move, you may not necessarily carry those relationships with you. And though those relationships can often be instrumental, in acquire, helping you to access opportunities or work, um, it's much more important to be independent than it is to have those close-knit relationships. It's important to pay attention to power dynamics in a learning relationship or educational relationship. Many of our students come from high context cultures where the teacher is the foremost authority and not to be questioned. That's very different from um, a low context culture or our American culture where the teacher is the first among equals generally and questions are welcomed. They do not threaten his or her status and in fact questioning is a sign that the student is thinking about whatever the subject matter is. Um, in a high context culture, knowledge is embedded in the situation, of course, because things are implicit. Um, things are connected, synthesized, and global. Multiple sources of information are used, and thinking is deductive. That goes from the specific to the general. Um, Learning occurs by first observing others as they model or demonstrate them and then practicing. Oftentimes, that takes the form of rote uh, learning activities. Groups are preferred for learning and problem solving and accuracy is valued. How well something is learned is important. On the low context side, um, reality is fragmented and compartmentalized. One source of information is used to develop knowledge. Mm, I would take issue with, with that. I think that 
um, in many of our learning environments, we use multiple sources of information and or we use a source that has been compiled from multiple sources of information. Um, um, Mr. Hall says that thinking is inductive, that goes from the general to the specific. Learning occurs by following explicit directions and explanations of others. An individual orientation is preferred um, or learning for learning and problem solving, and speed is valued. How efficiently something is learned is important. If you're wondering who's on the high context side and who's on the low context side, just think for a moment about the fact that culture occurs along a continuum. We don't all skew to the right or to the left. Oftentimes, we we lean out from the middle towards the left and towards the right. As you can see, looking at this continuum, um, our country tends to skew towards the low context end. Here are some things to pay attention to as you get started working with students who very likely come from high context cultures. It's important to pay attention to the nonverbals. Some students may not make eye contact with you. That's something that they're learning to do. In, in America, making eye contact is a sign of respect and a sign of acknowledgement and understanding. In other parts of the world, making eye contact is a sign of disrespect. Pay attention to status. As we talked about um, teachers and educators, anyone who is dispensing knowledge is seen as an authority. And your student may feel that they're not able to ask questions or communicate to you that they haven't understood something because to do so might, in their way of thinking, cause you to lose uh, face. Help them to understand that asking questions and letting you know when they don't understand is helpful to you and not at all disrespectful. Their conversations with you may at times be more for the purpose of building relationships than just for exchanging information. And it's important to take a moment in those intimate tutoring relationships to get to know each other, to find out a little bit about each other's lives. After all, we're here to help them accomplish their goals and we can't do that if we don't know what they are where they've been, and where they want to go. Once you complete your assignments, send them to Rachel. Please respond to each assignment in a Word document or as the body of an email. Rachel's email is revinson at learningworks.me.